This meeting is being live streamed. And we are live, Luis. We are finally live. Got it. Oh, yay. Hi, Luis Conti. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. My pleasure, Vicky. I'm glad to be here. You know, I it was such a thrill to to see you play and to to hear you, to see you, to play with James, forget about it. And then to see you in that little club with Santa Fe and yeah. um I don't know which, you know, they were both thrilling in their own way because you just really got to, you had looked like you were having so much fun when you were playing with Santa Fe. Oh, yeah. Well, I have fun all the time. If I'm playing, I'm having fun. But, you know, with James, it's awesome. I can't. It's a great, great band. And then the Santa Fe thing was like, it was so funky, man. It was just great. I just so, loved it. Did you, do you know Jerry Lopez? Yeah. Actually, Jerry, yesterday, I had a text from him. I did a session for him uh, and the Santa Fe Horns like years ago. I mean, this is, we couldn't remember when it was. Yeah. <laughs> like, but he's, he, I had a text yesterday that says, hey, look what I found. And it's a picture of us. Greg Matheson co-produced the thing with Jerry. So it's Greg Matheson, Jerry, and myself on a picture. You know, we're just talking. I go, oh, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I know him. I just never been able to go and see them play in Vegas in their, at their thing. You know, is it Mondays or Tuesdays? It's which day it is. Every Monday, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're pretty extraordinary. They're, and, and the fact that the band is always in rotation is fantastic also. I, I couldn't believe that when, when we were done, I started talking to the guys. He goes, that bass player goes like, oh, I'm just subbing. I go, <laughs> what? I know, he was crazy. Yeah, man. And Jerry said, well, you know, a keyboard player, a bass player, and, da, 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 da. and we're like, whoa, man. The it's percussionist crazy. that you that you sat in on, on his on his yeah. rig yeah. wrote to me today and said that he's gonna come on the show. He he was so in awe that you were playing. Yeah, it was it was fun. It was he's he's a good player too, man. It was it was just great listening to them. So Luis, when when well, you and I are pretty much exactly the same age. So yeah. for me, James came into my life, I think I was 14, 14, about 14 years old. It was, well, no, it was 1971. I was 15 and a half or so when I heard James for the first time. Yeah. But you were, you had already left Cuba? Yeah, I was already here. I was here. You were here. So did you know who James was when he came out with Sweet Baby James? No. No, the first time I heard James was uh, the song You Got a Friend. Was was I don't even know which, was that on Sweet Baby James? No, uh -uh, that's later, yeah. Yeah, that's the first time I heard it. And that was a huge hit. And I, I actually remember where I was the first time I heard the song. I was at a friend of mine's house. And, uh, you know, high school friend. And I was going, man, that's a nice tune. And I remember there was a conga part. Do, 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 like, that's cool. You know, and then years later, I'm blessed to be able to play with him. You know, that's incredible. Have, but you've gotten to play with, I would imagine, so many of your heroes because you've played with everybody. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I've played you, with a lot of you, folks. Yeah. You, you've played with everybody. And is there anybody still that you haven't gotten to play with that, that you would? Still, it's one of the two Beatles, man. I have not worked, ever worked you, with them. Really? You've. Wow. I've Ringo would love you to death. He would love you to death. I've, I've, yeah, I know them. I met them both. And I'm honored to say that I was at, actually at Ocean Way, the, or United Recorders now, who just closed, by the way. And really? I was in studio, yeah, I was in Studio B. And Ringo was going to be working on Studio A. And Bruce Sugar, I ran into Bruce, his, his, his engineer. He go, man, I'd love to meet Ringo, you know. He says, oh, man. Yeah, well, you know, we'll see what happens. Well, I was at at the lounge when we're on a break and Ringo comes in and say, Hey, Luis, how you doing? He's like, you know me, man. I was shocked. <laughs> wow. It's such a pleasure, but I've never worked with him. I've never played with Ringo or with Paul. And I've met them both. It was fantastic meeting them, you know? And so from what I've, I've, I've heard from you, uh, listening to interviews of yours, you were a big Beatle fan, but e but you were able to be a Beatle fan even when you were in now. How were you a Beatle fan in Cuba? Because you weren't allowed to listen to that music, were you? That's right. It's against the law. Wow. They would write, write you up. They call they would call my parents to school and go, like, your son is listening to imperialist music. Wow. Well, crazy, man. 
But you know, you would hide and just listen to the stuff real soft. There was uh, it was a struggle because uh, I remember there was. How did you even hear about them, Luis? We heard about them the first time I ever heard of these guys. I was in junior high, first year junior high maybe or whatever, and a friend of ours. You know, you have your your local friends. Right. Your friends have have was able to help to leave Cuba with his parents, and. Somehow we got a letter because letters would come in sometimes, sometimes the one he mailed a letter to one of my other friends and he showed up with his bubblegum card. And the, and the letter said, <laughs> hey, in the back of it, he said, this is what's happening now, man. These guys are called the Beatles. This is the greatest thing that's happening right now. And we look at these guys, you know, this hair and, you know, it's the Beatles. And it's a picture, it's an early, early bubblegum card. Right from wow. East, East, I remember East, those bubblegum cards. Yeah. So guess what? Next day, all the friends in school all had that haircut. <laughs> 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 oh, they must have loved that in Cuba. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh. It was it was a mess, man, because you know, you couldn't grow your hair long. Not only that, you know. The situation was really horrible. It's even worse now, but it was it was bad enough. You couldn't buy new clothes. Everything it was rationed. We're living in a Russian on rationing cards. So I told my dad, Dad, these pants that I got, they're too wide. Look at this picture, you know. <laughs> I got so my dad my dad took me to a, a tailor. And he and they took a couple of my, my pants, you know, my you know, my slacks and made them skinny like you know the look your dad was very hip so my, my okay so hip. from what i get your dad was a doctor yeah yeah my dad was a doctor but also a musician well he would have been a musician if he wasn't a doctor because he played percussion and he loved the guitar and he just loved music he, he was the kind of guy i remember my dad we, we'd be sitting in the car and the radio would be going you know some new song would come on and he goes like hey check out the bass part man you know he was that kind of guy not just a regular guy. Yeah, he loved this song, and he was like, "Dig that part, dig that bass part." Oh man! And the piano is like, you know. Wow. Like, and and was your mother musical? Not really. She could dance. She was a very good dancer, but she wasn't inclined into like playing anything. Or she would sing. You know, she would sing just songs. You know, that she liked, but she wasn't into it at all. But my dad, my uncle, my father's side, and my two aunts. My aunts played guitar and piano. Wow. They were school teachers. And my uncle was a doctor too. And my uncle, I, he was, I mean, he, he lived in Clearwater, Florida until he passed away. And I would go down there on vacation. And the first thing that happened, he'd bring out the drums. <laughs> so, okay, so how, what, so did you become a percussionist because your father played percussion? Was that I, the thing? Well, I don't, well, you know, it's my grandmother's fault. It's your grandmother's fault. It's always the, the woman's fault. I'm, I'm from Santiago de Cuba, so that's in the southeast of Cuba. Right. My grandmother on my mother's side mm -hmm. lived in Havana. They're from Havana. My mom was from Havana. My dad met met my mom when he went to medical school, and when he became a doctor, they married and they moved to Santiago. So now my grandma stayed. My grandfather had died on my mother's side. Mm -hmm. I never actually met him, and she was living in Havana, so she would come and visit by bus, she would take a bus and come down to Santiago all the way across the island. And she would spend three months with us or so, and then go back to Havana, back and forth. Whenever she came to L to uh, LA, to Santiago, she'd bring me an instrument. The first one she brought me was a guido, you know, the scratcher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I would sit next to the radio since I was a little boy and just hit things to the radio, whatever <laughs> was playing which was Cuban pop music, you know, what they call salsa now. You know. So so what was Cuban pop music like? It's, it's, sal it's salsa. It's like, like you know, salsa. Okay. Club, uh -huh. uh, Celia Cruz. All those guys are Cubans, you know. Uh -huh. That's the root of, of salsa is Cuban music. So that and then on top of that, my, I mean, that's really my, it's my grandma's fault because I had a guido, then I had maracas, and then I made myself <laughs> another set of maracas. Then she brought me bongos. Then, and how old are you when you're doing all of this? I don't know, four or five, six. You're like a little, like a little kid. I got, I got a picture of myself. Uh, my dad took it. There's a little story for Christmas because my, okay, my dad would take me to the park. Yeah. And 
just before carnival, these guys would be playing what they call rumba, you know, or the carnival drumming. It's all drumming, it's percussion and, and singing. Wow. And my dad would bring me with my tricycle or whatever it was, and I had no, I want no part of that. I wanted to go <laughs> over there. So my dad would tag me over there, you know, I just stand there like a little kid. So my dad being a doctor, everybody knew him. Many people knew who he was. So one day before Christmas, I'm not sure, I think I was six maybe. They, these guys knock on the door and they had made a conga drum. And they said, Dr. Conte, we made this for your son. We know that he loves the drums. Wow. Yeah. And I have my picture. So I have a picture. It was Christmas Day. I, I'm sitting in a fire truck. <laughs> you can see a thing of holsters, you know, like a Western <laughs> set or something. And there's a conga, and I'm playing the congas. <laughs> and you don't care about the fire truck and the holsters. I mean, no. I was like grooving, man. So, you know, between that and, and my grandma, you know, and my parents would have parties. You know, you heard of the Buena Vista Social Club? Of course. So those guys originally, like the main singers, or um, Compay Segundo and Ibrahim Ferrer, they're all from Santiago, from my hometown. Uh -huh. And they knew my dad and they were friends and they would come to my house. And wow. like on my parents' anniversary party, they will always be there and they're playing. Wow. Or somebody For somebody's party. So whatever anniversary was, there they are. And there's guitar players and clave. So I would play claves along with them and yeah. So you got to jam with the Buena Vista Social Yeah. <laughs> I didn't, even know it. I didn't even know I was going to be playing this. It's just, it's just by osmosis. I started playing because I figured, you know why I started playing, man? I, I, was, I got out of high school and I'm still on my own here. My parents, I came by myself. Okay, wait, wait. Yeah. Tell us that story because that's, that's very compelling. Well, uh, when right, I took when, when you, I was say, telling you before we went on the air that when you were leaving Cuba, I was trying to get into Cuba because I was a yeah. little communist. But real, yeah. now, did you, did your father as a doctor, did he, did he make no more money? Did, did everybody make the same amount of, like, were you, did, did you not have money in Cuba? Uh, you are a little bit socially privileged, not money wise, because you're a doctor. No. You know, of course, but, but, doctor, you're, but you, you have are, the same amount of stuff as everybody yeah, else. Yeah, this is not like oh, here, you know, you see doctors are driving Porsches and, and right. Benzies. No, you know, my dad, you know, my dad was a little privileged. He had a car, he had a little Dodge, you know, because he had to be able to go. Yeah. Yeah. But basically a, a, a doctor in Cuba back in those days, I even know he's a social worker, you know, he just help people and he's a doctor. Mm -hmm. And he it's a little higher status because it's, you're a doctor, you know, hey, doc, you know, but it's not like this kind of rich thing or nothing like that. Did you, so, did your, did your father want to get to America? Was that his goal? You know, okay, let's start with this. In when the revolution, when Castro first takes over, right, he lied to everyone. Nobody knew he was a communist. Then he gets into this communism thing. That's the whole story, right? So when he turns, I remember actually I was watching that you couldn't help it because when the, he would speak it was everywhere. Right. It was on and the radio was on. You're hearing Castro speak, and he, I remember as a little boy he goes, I hear, "And this revolution is a Marxist, Leninist revolution. This is communism, socialism, and blah blah blah." My dad goes, "See, I told you." Anyway, there was when this went down, there were three kind types of Cubans. There were Cubans that said, "Yeah, right on, right on for." Mm -hmm. Socialism. We're staying with you, Fidel. The other ones that said, the hell it is, like that Jewish guy I told you about in Miami. We're out of here. Gone. Like a lot of people. Were people able to get out at the very beginning? At the very beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You could just get on flights and, and then it oh, got. Oh, you could. Oh, yeah. And both. And, but, yeah. But it, I don't know how. Long I mean, I, I know people that escaped, that had to escape on a yeah. boat. Yeah. But yeah. I believe in 61, mm -hmm. 60, 61, you could still sort of get out i believe i i'm too young to really know the dates right but i know at first because i know some like my grandma's best friend from childhood and her whole family left you know on on a plane you know right so this must have been like in 61 or something so anyway there was three different kinds of cubans the gun hoes the ones that went we're out of here and then there were some which was like my dad and my family and many that said this is not gonna last this is 
This is crap. Uh, right, like, the United States is 90 miles away. You know, this is last six months, whatever. Yeah, I'm not mm. leaving. I'm Cuban. This is my country. I'm not leaving my country. Right. So they got stuck. And we all got stuck. So I see. This goes on. And then now I'm 14. So years wait, did you, did you notice as a little kid life changing? Oh, yeah. Did life get worse for, for all of you? Immediately. Immediately. For me, in a way, I mean, the embargo happened. So I just hear my dad, like, we can't get this kind of medicine and that kind of other medicine and this other medicine. And, and it's just, it was, a, you know, I need new shoes. Oh, well, I have a rationing card here. We already got your tennis shoes for the year. You got to make sure they last. Dad, I got a hole in my tennis shoe. Well, so I did notice that. So when I turned 14, Castro does his, happens to do a speech, which everybody listens to, and he says, we need blah, 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 blah. We need the revolution. For the revolution, we need the young man. From four, 15 years old till whatever age, you're in the military. Everybody's in the military. I knew how to take apart an AK-47 at 14 years old. Let me just add you that, tell you that, okay? They trained you even when you were a boy to fight the American imperialism. It's all brainwashed, man. So my dad, I got to backtrack a little bit, during the revolution, while they were fighting, in the hills, there was an underground, and Santiago de Cuba is the center of, all the, of the revolution, where we're from. And the underground were all these young, all these young men. And some were, they were looking for them to kill them. You know, the Batista government was a horrible government. The previous government, it was hor horrible. So my dad was a revolutionary. My dad saved a lot of these guys because his hospital was outside the city, okay? And when it was martial law during the revolution, my dad would have these guys in, his, in the backseat of his car inside hollowed out they stick them in the back of the house wow get these guys out so these guys are now but the some that were that are left are now in the government because i just turned 14 you know so some years go by now castro says if you're 14 you're 15 you're not gonna you can't leave wow. so my dad says it's gonna be really hard to get you out of here but you gotta get out of here yeah okay you're gonna come with us, right? Because well, I'm a doctor. I don't know if they're gonna let me out, but it'll be like three, three months, six months. No worry, we'll be there. Okay, Dad. You know, the thing is, how are we gonna get you a passport? You're gonna have to. So he pulled a lot of strings. He knew a lot of people in the government, and I was able to get a passport. And it's just a super long story. He, yeah. um, one day, my dad says, "Hey, we're gonna fly to Havana." I go, "Fly? I've never been on an airplane. We always go to Havana by car." No, 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 we gotta go there and back. Oh, I'm all excited. I'm gonna be on a plane. We go there, we see my grandma, and then we go to the the uh, cathedral of Havana. Mm -hmm. And we have an audience with the Archbishop of Cuba. So it's my wow. dad. Yeah. My dad had also been a devout Catholic, so he had mm -hmm. influence in the Catholic religion. Catholic. So he gets we get to um the sacristia, whatever that is, the office of the and here comes the bishop and he my dad and him talked and this is the young man okay he was trying to get arranged for me to be able to leave to spain which was the only freedom flight they had at the time and a freedom flight was a flight that went from this socialist country to uh okay to, which was you can only go either to spain i believe or to mexico ah those are the only two ways out. So my dad tried to apply for both, whoever was first. and But it, it was going to be Spain, pretty sure. And he's sending you by yourself? Yeah. And so, how do you feel about that as a 14-year-old? As a I was a kid. I was just excited. You were? Excited. You weren't scared? Do you know no? what? Going back to the Beatles, I was going, I'm going to see the Beatles. <laughs> I'm gonna by the way, the Tony Beatles. asked. I'm going to <laughs> I'm gonna rock out, man. The Rolling, are you kidding? Rolling Stones, the Beatles. I'm, I'm, this is great. Tony asked if you got a Beatle haircut. Did you get a Beatle haircut? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> I was all Beatle out, man. I have Beatle boots and all that stuff. By the time I got away. So, so what happens in, in this situation of being able to leave, you have a final interview with the government people. You never know when it is. They just knock on your door and you got to be there. So 
my dad, you know, we're home and they knock on the door. Here's the police. And they're at is the interview. He says, so why does the young man want to leave Cuba? You know, he says, well, you know, listen, let's get us wrong. You know, he's, my dad has to just BS his way through the whole thing. Don't get us wrong. We love the revolution, but the young man, he, he's, he's really hard headed and he wants to go study abroad. He wants to study in Spain. He goes like, well, why would he want? I remember this conversation like it was night now. Why wow. does he want to go and study outside of Cuba if we have the best education of Latin America? My dad says, well, yeah, totally agree. The only problem is what he wants to learn and study is not taught in the island. And what is that? He says, he wants to be a Catholic priest. Here's a letter from the Archbishop of Cuba. I said to him that he's going to be picked up by the Jesuits of da 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 there you go. That's my story. Wow. How do the communists feel, the socialists feel about Catholicism, though? Well, they hated it. That's what I thought. So they're okay with you going there to okay become... They were okay with it. They were okay. They said, okay, approved. Wow. Like, That's uh, crazy. But it was horrible. It was horrible. It was... I had some hard hard years, man. I okay, so you get to Spain, you don't yeah. know anybody. What the hell? You're a kid. You're just 14 years old. What are you doing in Spain? I get picked up. I luckily, see, there was a because there were flights going to Spain. There was a refuge for Cubans set up by the Catholic International Catholic Committee or something like that. Mm -hmm. But my dad didn't want me there just to be like a refugee, you know, in the cattle. So right. he, that's why he had arranged this thing. Besides getting my exit to the Archbishop, he wanted me to be in a different place. So this Jesuit uh, priest named Mariano Rodriguez, Father Mariano Rodriguez is at the airport to pick me up. I had no idea who was going to pick me up. I just knew I was going to get to the airport. And I can't believe you weren't I afraid. I can't believe I it. Can't... Either. What this shit now? It's like, what? I mean, that's oh my God. no way. I wouldn't, I mean, I, I couldn't send my son out there, but that's the Are desperation. Are you kidding me? <laughs> this is like you that would like, wanted to go back in there. This is the desperation or what it is to want to be free. Yes. And freedom. Now I understand it in a That's completely different way, of course. That's of my course. parents, how, how, you know, and let me just say this, I didn't, my parents, I didn't see them again till night. This is 19, October 10, 1966. I didn't see my parents until 1972 or spoke to them. I never heard their voice because you couldn't call on the phone. Now it's oh. different. Now guys can call and make calls and all this stuff. But back in them days, so, okay, so you're in Spain, you're picked up by this priest. What happened? What do you I, do? I stayed, they had a, a residencia. The, 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 this priest was the head of this Jesuit, uh, kind of a room and board place. Yeah. Where there was a lot of young men from other parts of Spain, Spaniards from other parts of Spain, mm -hmm. that were there for going to school or, or, having, or they had a job or going to college or something. And I was just 15. I was the kid there, you know, the mascot. And I just stayed there with him and them and everybody. And I had three meals a day. You know, my dad put me in contact. He had given me this these phone numbers and things that he had gotten of this one family that had lived in our block that was living in Madrid. And they actually had had a business, uh, uh, furniture business. So I called them, hey, remember me? I'm Luis, you know, the doctor contest. Oh, yeah, I'm here, so and so. I'm waiting for my papers when I come to the United States. Oh, come on over and visit us, you know. So I would like go and hang out with them in the afternoon sometimes. It was like that. I was there for about four months. And, the, and, and so, how'd you get out of Spain? So, back in those days, there was, because it was a Cold War, right? There was a US law, immigration law, that said that if you were under 18 years old, and you were escaping or leaving a communist country asking for asylum in the United States, you were granted to come in, as long as you had a sponsor. And I had a third cousin of my dad. His name was Luis, just like me. He just passed away, unfortunately, about oh. three years ago. Yeah, he lived a long time, who had left Cuba years ago. Before the revolution, you know, he made his life in the U.S. He had married a lady from New York and they were living in Hollywood. <laughs> out of all places. <laughs> so, you know, through telegrams, my dad got a hold of him. That's the only way to communicate telegrams 
Western Union, and he asked him, hey, you know, my son's in Spain. He needs a, an affidavit and somebody to take care of. He wants to come, you know, I want him to come to the United States and study in the United States, go to school. He thought I was going to be a doctor. <laughs> you know, except, or whatever I wanted to be. My dad was a beautiful guy, man. Well, next time I saw my dad, he says, man, I don't care what you're doing. As long as you're doing what you do is you you are doing your best at it. That's what he said to me. I love your dad. Did your dad live to see you be successful? Oh, yeah. yeah, except, you know, my, my he did see me play a lot, a lot with a lot of groups. But my my big, big, first big, big, big gig was Madonna. We have to talk about that. Yeah, that was really big, you know, huge. And did he live to see that? He never got to see that. He got he passed away. Just he got sick just when I got the gig. He got cancer and passed away. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I I believe that he knows and saw that. Oh yeah. 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 He was beautiful, man. Okay, so so you you got sponsored because your your uncle Luis is here, your cousin. Yeah, um, cousin, a third cousin. He was a third cousin of my dad or so. And, and so I, you come to Hollywood. <laughs> here I am in Hollywood, you know. And, you know, the first thing I wanted to do is like, hey, I got to, you know. Oh, at that time, there was the monkeys were happening also. So I'm watching TV, you know, and, and uh, it's the, you know, bell bottom pants and the, the white belt and the boots. Oh, my God. I had to like, you know, it was crazy. I, talk, I talked Luis's. They didn't have a lot of money, so one of Luis's friends, best friends, was doing real well. And I talked to him into like, "Hey, man, I still got my Cuban clothes, man. Can I like?" And he took me. He took me to a store and he bought me some pants, and I was cool, man. When I went to high school, <laughs> yeah. And like so that. now, were you? How was your Cuban education? Like, were you educated comparable to? Uh... This is what I will say. Now is not the same. Okay. But in those days, the education in Cuba was better than here. Wow. Now is is crap. Now is it's really everything is just going horribly for what I hear and for what I know, guys. And but then when I when I first thing that happens, they put me. I didn't speak English. I, I wasn't really fluent. I was pretty good. I learned English in three months. I was going to ask you how. So how did you do that? One of the one of the first things that was great was. Lola, which I called, was my cousin's wife. She was a social worker, and she spoke Spanish and English. She was Jewish. She was a Jewish lady from New York. Perfect Spanish. And the first day, you know, they say, hey, yeah, this, this is the family room. There's the TV, blah, 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 blah. You know, here I am. I got my room. Okay. Uh, I go and put on the TV. So I ch change channels, and what do I put on? The Spanish channel. It was only one, channel 34. It's the only uh -huh. thing I understand. She came in the room immediately and goes like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. You can, after you do your homework and all that stuff and take care of the things you have to do, you can watch all the TV you want, but it has to be in English. <laughs> I see you watching television in Spanish, I'm taking your TV rights away. No TV. Oh, so yeah, but I don't, I don't understand anything. I said, you never will. You will real soon. Watch. So a combination of that plus loving rock and roll. And my dad spoke a little English. So now wait, while well, you're listening to like the Beatles and stuff. So you're listening to the Beatles, but you don't know what I want to hold her hand means. Well, I would get translations with a dictionary. So I knew certain things. Mm -hmm. And also my dad loved he loved music and American music too. He had like big band records. He also loved Frank Sinatra. He had Nat King mm. Cole records and he would play it out of the house. And I would just, you know, your ear is going. Right. I'm to, you know, unforgettable, da, 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 you know, whatever. I didn't know what that meant. I bet your dad would have gone crazy to know that you played with Tony Bennett, huh? Oh, he would have freaked out. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So, um, I, but I would ask, like, I, I remember asking my dad, can't buy me love. What does that mean? Can't buy me love. It was like, well, that must mean, you know, you really can't, you know, you can't buy the, what that means, you know, it's, it's love. You can, you don't buy it with money. It's, oh yeah, can't means I can't. So I already knew a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I remember asking him, 
I remember this like today, right now. It's like, Dad, what does this mean? You've got to hide your love away. That's really weird. If you're learning, <laughs> yeah. English, it doesn't mean anything. You've got to hide your love away from the from help, right? He was actually stumped too. He was like, "Well, I don't, not really sure. It, this, it must be that you can't, you know, it, you know." I speak perfect English, and I can't explain that to you. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I don't know what the hell I mean. So I learned in three months. You know how I know I I knew English. I had a crush on this one girl in high school, and I had a dream about her, and I was talking to her in English. Ah! When, you dream, when you dream in a foreign language, you know the language. Wow! Did you did you watch the monkeys on TV? All the time. That, yeah, because that that would be one thing that would help you learn English. That and Saturday mornings, the Beatle cartoons. Oh God, yeah. Saturday morning, mm -hmm. it was the Beatle cartoons. I never, I was, I was in, I was in heaven, man. But I miss my family and it was. My my uh, my especially my three years of high school they were really hard because I I didn't have my family with me. You didn't have your family. You're struggling. Well, so you're not struggling with English. After a few months, you you've kind of got it, right? Uh, about three months. Three. And now, are you playing music during this time while I, you're in high school? You know, I also played guitar. Ah, did I you teach yourself a, or did you? No, I had a guitar teacher in Cuba. I was when I was a kid. I studied solfeo and the whole thing. And my dad, I told my dad, I want to learn how to play guitar. He bought me a guitar. And so you, so you read, you read music. Yeah, yeah. Not, not notes, not as well as I read rhythms because I kind of mm -hmm. left the reading to like just the rhythm thing that I do, you know. But mm -hmm. I can read chords and all that kind of thing. I can play the chord chart on the guitar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I got in a band with some young kids in high as school. As a guitarist or as a percussionist? Playing guitar. Playing guitar. Yeah. And I really, honestly, I didn't get into percussion until I was like, I'm a really late guy, man. I was like 18. Oh. I played percussion when I was four. Right. And six and not even known it, you know. But I didn't go like, oh, I want to play this. You know, I, I was at a, it's this uh, different situations, but this one moment where I was at this one party of, I was in, uh, I was going to Los Angeles City College. I just graduated from high school. And there's a party of a bunch of friends and there's guitars, guitars going and a guy pulled out a conga drum. And I grabbed, and I went on, immediately went to the conga drum and I went and played, boom, 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 boom. And I could tell you like right now, my body went <laughs> wait a minute. Wow. That's it. You mean you hadn't played you hadn't played since you were a little kid? No, since I left Cuba. Since since wow. 15. I, was, I left when I was 15. I was uh two more weeks, I would have been 15 years old. So I was almost 15. Wow. I played guitar. I had a guitar. I have uh, saved up and bought a like a fake Les Paul that I could afford when I was living in Hollywood with with my own cousin, and I always had a guitar. And this this was just like, but I never you know a real conga drum a real. I didn't think about it until then. It's really weird. It's really weird. Okay, so you so you have that moment. You have that like epiphany. Now you're in a band. You're a guitar player. How do you make the transition? How do you I become start, a? I just start asking, where do, ah, where do like, we, and you have to start amassing all this stuff, right? Yeah, because my my relations to the to the percussion is either you know those guys that would come to my house and play, or the guys that would be at the park with a whole bunch of guys drumming, you know? right? But it's in Cuba, it's really good drumming and very well organized drumming. Excuse me, it's not like. Here, you know, we call them thunder drummers. You know, you go to Venice Beach and they just go, bum, 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 you know. Right. At, at that age, I'm young. I'm like, I go like, where is, where do people play? And somebody goes, oh man, at Griffith Park. They used to be on Sundays, used to be a big ass drum circle. And then in that drum circle, there was a couple of guys that were like, I could, I could tell, even mm -hmm. if I wasn't like, I could already play. I could play when I started playing. It was weird. Mm -hmm yeah and i met this couple of guys one guy says i said man where do you where do you hear cuban music and, says, well, and the guy this guy from, from new york 
he says, well, you know, there's music in New York. There's a bunch of like, it wasn't even called salsa then. That there was no name to this music. There's a bunch of Cuban music bands, Willie Colon, Eddie Palmieri, Tito Puente. I never heard of these guys. You know, I says, well, where do I hear this stuff? He says, well, there's a store downtown LA. It's the only place you could buy this music. Wow. On Broadway and Third, Doran, I never, Doran Music. Go to there and you can buy those records there. And I bought a couple of records and I started, as I'm still listening to The Who and Led Zeppelin and all this other <laughs> stuff. Because I'm still into that. I started listening to the stuff and I started meeting guys, finding out where this is club and that other club. And it's just pff, spiral. It just works. So now how do you turn it? How do you go from being in LA college to being a professional musician and being a percussionist? How does this happen? I gave up. I had a little job at, a, at the Hollywood Ranch Market who closed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I told the manager, hey, you got to lay me off, man. Oh, what? He says, yeah, I don't want to quit. You got to lay me off. That way I can collect unemployment for nine Yeah, months. yeah. I want to play music. The guy was real cool. He said, okay. Boom, boom, boom. So I start, like I said, trying to find out what's music going on. And I go to this, there was this club down on, uh... this is how I get my first gig. This is like, it happened fast, man. There's a, there's a, a club called, Chess Pico was on Pico in Vermont down there in LA. Mm -hmm. And there was a, it was the leader was the guy that played congas. His wife sang. There was a timbale player, piano and bass. And I just went in there. I was underage, but I lied. I was 21. I went in, you know, I met the guys. I became friends with them. You know, I started going. And uh, one day I, I hear about the musicians union. Oh, well. If there's a musician's unit, I must be able to get a good job there. <laughs> yeah, right. Guess what? I go to where is the musician's union. I had a motorcycle, man. That's the only way I got around. And uh, where's the musician's <laughs> union? He goes, oh, it's on Vine and you know, on Melrose, blah blah blah. I get the address. I go over there with my bike. And where do, who do I run into? I run into the timbale player that played with these guys in that club. Wow. Right. And he said, his name was Johnny Cheddar. I'll never forget him. He says to me, hey, Luis, how you doing? I said, oh, fine, man, Johnny, how are you, man? Yeah, I'm at the union here, see what, get a job here. He says, well, <laughs> good luck. He says, but there were some guys here. There was a lady and a guy that are looking for somebody to play percussion. They say they have a record coming out or that is out already in the East Coast and, and they're gonna go to the East Coast and this and that. Really? He says, yeah, here's the number, call him up. So I go to the pay phone. I talk to the lady, her name was H. Ann Kelly. Well, long story short, this group is called the Hughes Corporation and they had a hit song, a song that became a hit called Rock the Boat. Oh rock God, the Rock the Boat, don't rock the boat. And it had yeah. congas. <laughs> On the record, there had been a guy named Chino Valdez was the guy that used to do a lot of sessions in those days. This, I didn't know anything about sessions or nothing. And I, that was the beat he played. So they wanted a percussionist to play that. And they were going to go, we went to New York and New Jersey, blah, 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 blah. Wow. So you got into a touring band, like, right. Like that. I called wow. my friend. I called the lady. I says, what, she says, what are you doing? You got to come audition. I go, what's that? He goes, well, you got to play for us. <laughs> okay. Well, where at? You know, give me the address. It was South Central. And well, like it was like Washington and La Cienega or, or, or Crenshaw or something like that. I didn't have a car. I had a motorcycle. So I called a friend of mine and I had a car. Hey, what are you doing, man? Listen, listen can you do me Wait, a do you have the stuff? Do you have like enough stuff? Condo. Yeah, by then I had to set up con I saved up. Remember, I had a job. I had, I had bought congas. I had a tambourine, you know. I yeah. got my guitar, you know. I had things. I didn't have a, an arsenal of stuff. Just very right, stuff. right. You know, I didn't own timbales or bongos. I just like congas. So I called my friend and said, man, you got to do me a favor. You got to give me a ride, man. I'm going to get this gig, you know. I didn't even know the word gig. I said, I'm going to get this job. <laughs> What's happening? I said, yeah, okay. So he gave me a ride there with my congas. I played. So you got the gig. Cool. Wow. It was in Philadelphia. I was at a first place we played was uh, in Washington, D.C. I don't remember the name of the place. It was a, kind of like a theater. And everybody was black. 
and everybody was doing this weird dance. I was like, what is that? It was the bump. Oh. Yeah, I was <laughs> like, yeah. I wow. took them on the plane. I checked them on the plane and everything. It was like with cases. I had to buy cases. And... Wow. Yeah, that's how it happened. So, so you started making a living, and your family's still not here, right? Oh, they're still not here. And so, how long did you do oh, that? Wait, wait, wait. By then, my family had just come. That's right. That's a mistake. Yeah, they had just come while this is going on. Yeah. And now, so what does your father, who was a doctor in Cuba, do when he gets to America? Well, he has to start studying to how he can get past the board, you know. And there was a couple of exams he had to take and get his English really get going. And then he eventually passed the test. But he went down to Florida and practiced down there with my uncle. who had, They had a medical thing going, you know. That's what my dad did, but in, in that at that time that I was doing the, you know, the Hughes Corporation on the thing, you know, he was he was still, you know, it took him a couple of years to get his thing going. Well, yeah, that that makes sense. And so, so how long did you rock the boat? <laughs> I rocked the boat for about a year. Yeah. And, and the reason why it lasted that long is because I was still a Cuban citizen. Uh, I was an American resident, but I was. I was not an American citizen. Wait, oh, so America wasn't give. wait, America was giving asylum though to people who were leaving for yeah. political reasons, right? Yeah, yeah, and I came into the country as a resident. I had a green card when I came into the country. Most people come in and they have to wait five years. Right. Because I was on the range. I remember when, I, when, I, when my third cousin picked me up at the airport when I came from Spain, that night he goes, hey, let me see your papers. He goes, well, here's my Cuban passport. And then they gave me this thing. They said, where'd you get this? I go, I don't know. They gave me that at the embassy. He said, well, you're an American resident. I said, what wow. does that mean? He goes, you're not a refugee, man. You're like, you're a resident. You're the real deal. Well, I, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, but I didn't, I was, I, I was not a citizen of the U.S., so I couldn't have a U.S. passport. I had to travel with my Cuban passport. So in those days, and still now, to go, I played with the Hughes Corporation until they started, and they started, they were going to go on tour to Europe. I couldn't get visas to go to Europe. It was too difficult. Mm. So I kind of like just stayed home and I got my shit together, became a citizen. I learned my lesson. You know, I applied to- How, was, it, was that hard for you? Was it hard to become a citizen? No. No, it was really, for me, it was really easy because it's, that's a whole other funny story because this, you're going to laugh, man, because um, people have to apply to become a citizen. Now right. it takes longer. Back then, it didn't take us long, but it would take a, a year or, or a couple of years. Right. Well, I go to the immigration office downtown LA, where it was at the time, and there's a huge line. I said, you know, later for this, I'll come back tomorrow. There's too many people. So I go across. This, this is early in the morning. I go across the street to a place, you know, get ham and eggs, and I'm getting breakfast. And one of my best friends from LACC, Los Angeles City College, is eating there. I go, hey, Louis, what are you doing? Hey, man, what's happening? His name was Mickey from P Panama. He was Panamanian. He said, what, what's up, man? He says, well, I went in there to try to get my uh, application to be a citizen. And there's too many people. I'm going to come back tomorrow. He says, dude, it's like that every day. I go, really? Well, you, well, how do you know? He says, well, you know, you know, I became, I was a study, I'm studying law and immigration law. So I'm one of, the, and I got a job. I'm one of the guys that gives the exams for immigration, for, for citizenship. No kidding. It says, yeah, so I'll tell you what, I can help you out. You do have to make that line. Come back tomorrow, come early, make the line. When you make the line, you fill up your application, you drop the application in, you call me. I take the application, that's gonna take you six or seven or a year to get called. I'll put it up right here and they'll call you next week. Wow. You come in, you take the test, I can't guarantee you I'll be the guy to give you the test. This is crazy, man. I'm being so blessed. I'm not the guy that could give you the test, but you went to school here. You know all the stuff. You know history and stuff like that. You take the test, and then uh, that's it. You'll pass, and then they'll call you in about three months. You you swear. You get sworn. In. I was a citizen in like three, four months. Did you study for the no. test? No. 
Wow. He told me basically what they're going to ask me, who's the first president of the United States, what's name three of the Bill of Rights, and, you know, just little simple things like that, so. Wow, okay, so so you stop rocking the boat, yeah. and uh, and so you, okay, so what's like, that's a pretty, that's a big gig, so yeah. what, so what happens at, be, between that and Madonna, what are you doing? Right, that was a great gig. And I, I got to do Soul Train, ABC. Oh, wow. Back in the day, ABC in concert, Don Kirshner. Oh, yeah. Concert, the Midnight Special. With oh, that, yeah. And now I'm home. So what do I do? I go back to my roots. I start playing Cuban music. So I start playing with a, the with a Latin. There was only a couple of salsa, but called Salsa now. I know, are, there, are there clubs in LA where you can make a living doing that? Kind of. Hmm. Uh, there was a club in by MacArthur Park called Virginia's. That was like the center of the thing. Mm -hmm. It was a good area in those days. And and you could, you know, I was playing five, six nights a week. Oh yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. And rent was cheap, you know, everything was cheap. Yep. Um, so I'm there and I meet, you know, it's, you know, music, man. It's, you start meeting people, you know? Right. And one of the guys who became one of my best friends, he was such, such a, such a best friend that comes and calls me up. He goes, hey bro, the Supremes are auditioning guys for percussion. I'm going to audition. You should call them up and do it too. I go, okay. I called up, audition. I got the gig. Wow. While I'm at, while I'm at the audition, I, I didn't know that there was a guy named Gil Askey. You ever heard of him? I don't think so. He was Diana Ross's musical director. He worked No, but him. I knew her husband. I knew Bob Ellis. Yeah, he Did, did you lot. know Bob? No, no. He, he uh, he did a lot of stuff for Motown and stuff. Anyway, mm -hmm. after I get the gig with the Supremes and we go to Las Vegas, where I meet a whole bunch of other people there and I meet Louis Belson. It's a whole lot. That's a wow. whole lot. I'm in Vegas and I come back. I get a call from this Gil Askey guy. I go, hey, Luis Conte, listen, I was at the audition when you were auditioning for the Supremes. You sound, you sound really good, man. I am Diana Ross's musical director. We're going to do a tour. I want you to play in the band. So now I'm playing with Anna Ross. Wow. Yeah. And you know, it's just, you keep networking and meeting people and you start playing jazz, Claire Fisher. I heard about, I hear about the Bay Potato. I go down there, Sea Wind was playing. I meet Steve Foreman. I mean, I start meeting other percussionists. I start finding out about like, oh, there's, there's recording sessions. Oh yeah, how does that, what's your first, uh, what's your first session? Well, my first recording session, I was so green, I got sent home because I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> why, why did you, what did you do that they well, said? I wanted me to play congas and I didn't know the simplest, you know, I'm still kind of Cuban, okay? This is actually before, <laughs> this is after the Hughes Corporation, but the simplest thing to play in a, as a Cuban, as a conga player, is a thing we call tum, it's like tum, pak, boom, boom, pak. It's what you hear when you got a friend, you know? For, okay. Very simple. It's in a lot of records, pak, pak, boom, boom. But you, you make a lot of in-between notes. And so the guy put the thing up and I went, I played it and he said, ah, it's, it's too busy. Come mm -hmm. listen a little bit. I listen, I go like, well, that doesn't sound too busy to me, but whatever. Okay, okay, let's try it again. Just don't play as much. I didn't know what to do. So I don't remember what this thing was or who the people were. I wish I did. Mm. It was a studio in Hollywood. But the guy actually literally wrote me a check for 100 bucks. He said, okay, thank you very much. And I know I didn't cut it, you know. Okay, so between that and the next time you go in the studio, what do you okay. learn? And, and what's the next time you go in? And I bet it was a different experience. Yeah, it was, I'm now playing with Diana Ross and Greg Wright was one of the singers, background singers with Diana. And no, well, he was a piano player or something. He played, I don't remember what he did. Anyway, he, was, he worked for Motown and they called me to do a session. He called me to do a session at Signet which was Motown Studios in the West Coast, then became Signet, now it's nothing, now it's not a studio. In there, I don't know, I don't remember for who, and I had to play, and I did well, you know. By then I had, you know, Cabasa, and I had Woodblock, Clave, 
tamarind. You know, I got more. You also understood about less is more. Yeah. You got I, that less. You got that lesson, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I just grooved, and and I had already played with Diana. You know, I knew what to do. You know, kind of. So who else? So after Diana, who else was in between there before you got to Madonna? Okay, this is um, Doc Severinsen. Doc Severinsen. That's so <laughs> I, while I'm with Diana, I start going to Vegas. There's a couple of Cuban guys up there. They, the father of Walfredo Reyes that plays with Chicago now. I'm Walfredo, I, I've interviewed Walfredo. I love Walfredo. Wally, we're best friends. We're like oh. brothers. And his dad, Walfredo Reyes Sr. Oh, yeah. He's the last Man. of the Mohicans. This guy oh, is, yeah. the last of the, is the greatest. Is all is our godfather. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's my musical father. Wow. Oh, yeah. I love him, man. And uh, I meet him. You know, I meet these guys in Vegas. They were living in Vegas, blah, blah, blah. Right. He told Junior, we start hanging out, blah, blah, blah. We jam at his house, at Walfredo's house every day. Wow. Yeah. And I go, I'm home, and Walfredo calls me on the phone and says, hey, man, you don't play mallets, right? I go, no, not really. He says, okay, you know this guy, Doc Samerson? I'm, I'm, I'm playing with him, but I also play with Wayne Newton. That's him talking, right? He says, right. so Doc used to open Wayne Newton, but now he's doing his own show and we're conflicting, so I can't do both gigs. I asked Doc, what do you want? You want a guy that plays really good mallets and has no feel, or you want a guy that can play the percussion, the groove stuff, and has a really good feel? And Doc said, no, give me a guy with a feel, man. So you're the guy. You're going to have to play a little mallets. So we're going to send you, blah, blah, blah. Somebody's going to call you, this and that. I flew out to Vegas. I saw that they flew me out there to see the show. Came back. They gave me the music. Alfredo sort of helped me. And I wow, went. Wow, that's so great. Yeah, with the percussion. With the, I had a couple of timpani parts to play. They weren't that hard. And uh, a couple of uh, orchestra bells. Everything else was groove. And we killed it, man. Wally was playing drums. Well, for He's so great. I the love greatest. him. He's great. My bro, man. So great. that's what happened. I worked a lot with Doc and all of that. And I started working with a lot of people, you know, I mean, Claire Fisher and Tanya Maria from New York. And I started getting calls for I, Paul. Do you ever meet Paul Lime? No. He was a very busy studio drummer in LA. Mm -hmm. And he was, he knew Doc really well. And he started playing with Doc sometimes. And that's how I learned about the the thing with the TV sessions and because he used to do a lot of that. Uh-huh. You know, like I remember him telling me one time back in those days, he says, listen, man, you get a call for a session and you can't make it because you're out with Doc playing somewhere. You don't tell him you're out of town. You just tell him you're booked. People don't want to know you're a road guy. Uh-huh. You know, I learned a lot of things from Smart. him. It's so great that you guys all help each other and yeah, he have that wonderful. brotherhood. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. No, he's not. He lives in Nashville. It's, we're still very close. Anyway, so I'm all moving around. And I, when I do clinics and things like that, I, I talk to young men. I said, look, it's not only how you play. You have to be a good guy and a nice guy, and you have to get along with people. Mm -hmm. Just be cool. You're not a superstar because you play with Diana Ross or you play on the Tonight Show sometimes. I mean, who, who cares? You just got a good gig. You're not better than the other Joe, you know? And uh, so I'm at a Christmas party of, you know, Jody Cortez and Dean Cortez. Mm -hmm. These guys are used to play in a band called Charisma with David Garfield. And I just met David Garfield a few weeks ago. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so uh, Jody invites me to a Christmas party, a Christmas Eve party with his parents that were coming from Puerto Rico because they're Puerto Ricans. And, and there, there's this guy named Mike Bloom, who was Pat Leonard's right-hand guy. Pat Leonard is Madonna's producer. So I was a nice guy to everybody. And, and, and Michael Bloom calls me up and goes, hey, man, there's these auditions happening. And this, the, this is a recording thing, and then if you do that, then you have to audition for Madonna if you want to go on tour. I went like, sure. What do I got to do? He says, well, here are the songs you got to listen to. 
Papa Don't Preach, Live to Tell, and I forget the other one. It's from the True Blue album. Okay. And, and so this is the mid eight. This is mid eighties. This is eighty six, eighty seven, because the tour was in eighty seven. So I said, yeah, okay, but you know what? I mean, I was already pretty. I already knew a lot about the music business, and I, and I remember asking this question: Is this a cattle call, or how many guys are auditioning? Because if there's a lot of people, I'm not going to do that. He says, no, no, there's only three guys, you and two other guys. Okay. So I go, I remember Leeds Rental? Leeds uh, on Wellington. There was a rehearsal place on Wellington. Mm -hmm. Now, across from NRG Studios. That's NRG now. Anyway, that's where the rehearsal. I'm in New York. I was in New York until. Okay, so nothing would yeah. know. Yeah. So this is happening there. The auditions are there. I get there super early. Yeah. Set up my stuff. The drums are already set up, which is Jonathan Moffat, Sugarfoot. is the drummer with Madonna. He already played with her and he used to play with the Jacksons and all these guys. You know, big deal. Like, this is a big deal, man. I'm like, little Norwegian. <laughs> and at this studio, this rehearsal room, there was a balcony and there was a room up there in the balcony and the guys would play down here. And I'm just down here and this dude walks in and it's Jonathan, the drummer. Hey, man, how's it going? All right, Jonathan, hey, Luis, nice to meet you, man. That's it. That's all he said. And he sat down on his drums, tweaked them up, and he started playing a groove. I started playing with him. There's nobody else there. Whatever. We grew for a while. We find, guys start walking in, and then we stopped. And I hear from the balcony a voice that says, Hey, that was effing good, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Madonna, yeah, you, rocking, yeah, you, you know what that was? Madonna. <laughs> was there all along. We didn't even know. Wow. So I remember I played that afternoon with them, and there was a couple other guys coming after that in the next couple of days. They only auditioned one guy at a time, and they were auditioning a bass player too, and uh, that could play synth bass because that was the thing at the time. And I remember on a break. I kind of talked to Pat, Pat Leonard, you know, and, and I asked him a couple of questions and he said, hey man, listen, you don't have to worry about anything, about anything. All you need is those hands. So that sounded like, uh oh, I think I might have the gig. I wow. got the gig. Yeah. And so you were playing, that was when Madonna was God, like a goddess, right? She was like the number one in the world, right? Yeah, this was huge, man. This is huge. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. So, so what kind of what kind of what kind of stuff did you do with Madonna? I, I can't even imagine what that tour was like. Oh, I mean, what do you mean? What kind of stuff? Like, like what kind of venues are you playing? You're playing oh, like stadiums. Everything was. You, you're playing stadiums. stadiums. You're, you, you're you know baseball stadiums, uh, football stadiums. And every celebrity in the world is coming to see Madonna. Yeah, yeah. 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 of course. And yeah. I mean, and, and the first tour we played Versailles in, in Paris, that was 150,000 people or something. Oh my gosh. And like the biggest, I remember this, all this commotion because the bigger, the biggest star ever in, in French rock and roll was a guy named Johnny Holiday at the time. And I, he passed away recently. I never did work with him. I met him. And it was, people would say, oh, it's Johnny Holiday's there. You know, like, you know all these folks. Yeah. And so how, how was Madonna with you? Because I, I started to tell you before we came live she, that she was kind of a character with us. I was on Saturday Night Live with her on a sketch and she was- You know, man, weird. I never really had a problem with her. She, she, the thing with her in those days, I don't know what she's like now. I, I, I've heard a lot of comments on things that she might've changed a little bit, but she was very professional, super professional. She was a go-to person like, I'll give you an example. When we finally, she fired, she, they, we, they figured out what the band was, and I'm in the band. I says, okay, we're going to take a week break. Everybody talk to Freddie the man. That's the manager. And gets things arranged, and then come back, we start. Okay. When she comes in the first day of rehearsal after that, she says, the first thing that she says is, hey, how's everybody doing? So are you all motherfuckers uh, happy? <laughs> I was... You know what I'm talking about. You've been talking to Freddie the Man. I want to make sure everybody's happy. Nice. Okay, so she was like that, that, that kind of. She also enjoyed families. 
like I had my family on the jet. Oh, nice. So my wife and my two little kids, they came out of Paris, they came all over the place. Nice. Um, yeah. Oh, her personality though is she's got this kind of thing where in those days were like she would test you. If, How if, so? She would like sort of like say something that would kind of like either it insult you or sort of like kind of piss you off. Just try to piss you off. And if you went like this, oh, because that's Madonna. Oh, okay, well, you in hell. You never come back. Wow. You're like you had what? to stand up. You had to stand up to her. You stand up to her. You're in. Wow. I'm not that kind of. I didn't even know that. I'm just. I'm not gonna take shit from anybody, man. Wow. Yeah. And she did so. She does so much dancing in her show. Are they piping in her vocal? What What are they? Is she singing? Oh, what is she doing over there? She got a bunch of hell because I didn't do the very very first tour. It was in 1985. Uh huh. I I never saw it, but I heard that she she didn't have background singers in that show, in that tour, and they had their background vocals on. So everybody since then, oh. no, she's got piping in her vocals. There was never any tracks of vocals in any of those tours. I did three of them. Wow. At least in those three, I can tell you that it's wow. And she was in Olympic shape, man. That she had a trainer, and the trainer would tell me, "This girl, she could, she's in Olympic shape. She worked." I, I have never seen anybody who's yeah. taking care of their body like that. Like yeah. never, yeah. yeah, amazing. All right, so I promised you we were going to stop at six o'clock. We've already yeah. gone over. I, I have. I want. To, I want to ask you two things. I want to ask you about Phil Collins. I want to ask you about James Taylor. So Phil Collins, you're playing with one of the greatest drum with a great drummer. Yeah. And so, what what is that gig like to be playing with this great drummer? He's a he's a drumming icon, man. He's one of the greats. Right. So how is that for you? Well, one thing that is fantastic about working with him is as being a sideman. And a percussion player. When do you get to play with a star? And the star is a drummer. The star is always a singer, a guitar player, the front man, right? Like, uh, you know, trumpet player. You no, know, a guy that understands this. So it's a whole other kind of a thing. It's right from the get go. And we. So there's we, a mutual respect that. Yeah. It was so cool that when we go on the first tour, we are rehearsals in uh in switzerland he was living there and you know at first three four five days a week goes by of rehearsals we were there for like a month rehearsing i got a call late at night in the hotel room and it's phil hey luis what's going on well, he calls me luis what's going on luis hey, what's going on phil what's up man says hey listen i have never had a percussionist in my band in genesis or in my solo band so this is how cool it was man he goes so we always do a drum thing in the middle of the show, which we haven't rehearsed yet, but I never had a percussionist. So I don't know what would be comfortable for you to do. So if you got time and you'd like to, why don't you put something together that would be cool for all of us three to do? Check that out. Wow, wow, wow. And I said, you got it, man. I, I wrote it that night. I put it together wow. all night. The next morning, I, I called Kobe. He was the our uh, sound guy. I said, Kobe, we're gonna go in. I want to go in an hour early because I want to record this whole thing. It's all these break, all these things and these breaks. And I want to play for Phil. Okay, so I recorded it. And at the end of the first rehearsal, after that, I went up to Phil. Hey, Phil, remember you asked me about that drumming thing? If you got, if you're gonna stay for a minute, I got, I got something recorded. I want to play you. He says. Really, so soon. Wow, great, cool. He loved it. And that's what we did. That's what you see on the videos. That is so cool. Yeah. That is so cool. Yeah, so it's great. And and I can only imagine what a joy it was to play alongside him. Um, oh, man. And, you know, I'll tell you, it's like, I mean, and the first tour I did, Ricky Lawson, the late Ricky Lawson was playing mm -hmm. drums, who was, was an amazing drummer. But there's things that feel once and i remember we were rehearsing easy lover and we're playing it cool and then and phil's totally polite and he goes up to ricky and tells him a certain thing and and then finally so phil goes okay you know hey guys bring up my drums for the drums it was this, this stage where the drums would come off so they bring up his drums and we played easy lover with phil 
and it was a whole other thing I mean not a, oh, you, you know mean, he, mean? Didn't, he didn't play the drums at least a little during every show he only played on he we only played two two times he played oh uh, what's that song in the air tonight in the in the air tonight right he likes he doesn't like to sing he doesn't like to sing and play uh-huh he doesn't like to sing and play yes we're finishing now all right so so all right he doesn't like to sing and play and now he doesn't play at all right because no, he, doesn't play. He, he, got, he had a misfortune of having a bad uh back operation it kind of went south on him he, he doesn't feel one of his feet he doesn't have a feeling it's like it's it's really sad man he's yeah he's a, he's great uh, you know to see somebody i mean i can't imagine you know not to be able to play no you know so, and, I mean? and your health is good or i i'm i have two your health is good yeah thank the lord man i mean at my age i'm still hanging in there you know i got it's not perfect i'm like this and that but i'm hanging all I'm, right so the last question james taylor okay so you're playing with probably the most iconic one of those guys yeah he's he's uh he's how do you get that gig how do you get that gig how did i get that gig wait how did i get that gig uh, you've been with james for like a long time okay you remember did you remember me the late carlos vega no you know you know who he was carlos vega was a an amazing drummer drummers know about him and he was basically when jeff Pacaro was alive if jeff couldn't make the gig it was carlos yeah and Carlos played with everybody. He played with Arlita and Newton John. He used to play. He played with James for years. Uh huh. He was a huge session guy. You know, he's one of the cats. Uh huh. One of the first call guys in LA. Mm -hmm. So he passes away. Misfortune thing that happened. And this is 1998, I think it is. And I meet James at the funeral. At the service and all this and we actually played with it was like lenny castro alice acuna and myself mm -hmm. you know one little thing we just played congas for you know at the service and it was really beautiful so i had met, met james then and then jimmy johnson mm -hmm. the bass player mm -hmm. who's now the musical director mm -hmm. calls me up and goes uh hey man we're gonna do you know this carlos is not there now so we're trying to find a drummer and but we have to do this uh, DVD and and film this thing at the Beacon Theater, a James Taylor thing, and we got to do it. So Steve Jordan's going to play drums, but would you come and play percussion? They never had a percussionist. So okay, would you do you do you play drums? I play drums, but not well enough to do that. Mm -hmm. I can, like, you know, at a wedding I can play drums. You know, <laughs> at your party we could. Come on, let's hang. <laughs> but uh, so. I said, sure. So they were going to New York. We were in New York for a week rehearsing and then we filmed one night at the Beacon Theater. And then they were going off on tour. I was still working. I mean, I was working with both guys. I mean, I, I was working with Phil. We were gonna do this thing in Europe. So, but I remember about two or three days into rehearsal, James comes over and goes like, hey man, it's really great having you over, you know. But James is an angel, he's just, great man and he goes so uh you know we're going on tour from after the vegan theater thing you know you don't suppose you packed enough stuff to get on the on the bus with us <laughs> wow that's what he said i go like i'm going oh shit yeah well man i, I really wanted to do it you know man i'd love to but man i, I got in two weeks i gotta I'm, I'm going to europe you know for four weeks you know with phil collins and i i'd love to do it but i can't so I'm thinking, you know, the way the business is, well, there goes my gig, you know. And he goes, well, when are you done? I said, well, I'm done, you know, whatever it was, this day in September. And he goes, well, we still got like, I think we got another three weeks in the West Coast then. If you want, when you come back and you want to go out again, call us up and, you know, we'll see you out there. And well, really? You got it, man. As soon as I got home, I called, you know, the management and I said, hey, you know, James, this is Luis Conte. James said this. Okay, and that was out with James. Wow, and that was like 20 years ago, right? Yeah, well, that was 98. That's a long wow. time. And then I, uh, he didn't do anything in 99. 
that I know of. And or two thousand I then the next was it two thousand one? I think it was 2001 or 2000 that was the actual real that I went from the beginning to the end, you know, the whole real tour with Russ Conco on drums. And then after that, Russ started playing with Lyle Lovett and Steve Gadd came in. So since then, it's been Steve. So I think Steve came in in 2002. So it's like 20 some years. Wow. And he's, wow, a, he's, he's a beautiful, I mean, he's, he's just the other day we're in Vegas. He came, you know, he came out to my riser, you know, and got all my stuff and started hitting all my stuff. He said, hey man, what is this thing? You know, all this and that. And that. I love the respect he pays each of you oh, when yeah. he introduces you and he comes up and he shakes each of your hands. He's just so lovely. And and I think I told you we we Snuffy introduced me to him backstage after the show, and he said, I said, I'm friends with Lee. How come he did my show? He said, I want to do your show. And oh, yeah. he said, no, he said, I will just remind me. So Luis, I need your help. I got to get to James because he, oh, he meant it. He's sure. so lovely. I'll mention it when I see him. That's great. He was know, so, he, you know, because he does seem like he's just so real, so genuine. He's, he's super. He's, he's, he's the real thing. And, and the band is treated like the artist. We're, you we're, guys are phen phenomenal. You it's a are great phenomenal. crew. The crew is amazing. They've been there for years and, and, the, and the road management, you know, we have these two people that are just you know, Mr. Wise and, and, and uh, Wendy and they're just great. You're never hungry. Actually, you got to watch it. You gain, I gain, <laughs> people lose weight on tour. I got to watch it, man. I gain weight on the, on the games. <laughs> food. Okay, that's enough. I already ate, you know. Well, Luis, I thank you so much for doing this. You are so lovely. And I've so enjoyed spending this time with you. Thank you. And please let me know. And I will let uh, everyone in Facebook land know when you're playing locally so that we can come out and see you. Yeah, I definitely will. It'll probably be in October sometime, but. Okay, well, we'll be yeah. there. Thank you so much. Love you. It's been my pleasure being I adore here. adore you. Thank you, Luis. Good night.